CopyChat with SES, Symphony Creative Solution is co-organized together with them at NUS Enterprise. So Symphony Creative Solution is an innovation arm of NYP. So last year, we launched our first Oceans of Opportunity Challenge uh, in the maritime industry with a winning endorsement by the startup community as well as the ecosystem partners. And Tarako san from SES will be sharing more uh, in detail with us shortly. So since then, we have seen new business ideas emerging, the new technologies that challenge the shipping industry that has always been quite traditional and conventional in their ways of working and operations. And then uh, today, we have picked the topic sailing into digital waters. It is to illustrate the disruptive nature of the technology in the maritime industry and how we can streamline the various processes and change manual work into digital and virtual communities. So in the session today, we will delve more into the topic and on the impact and opportunities of the maritime industry. So we shall introduce a special keynote from Mr. Jeremy Nixon, <coughs> CEO of Ocean Network Express, the integration of Payline, MOL and NYK. So with its one of the largest fleets in the world, it has the six uh, the company has embraced new technology to integrate the different uh, integrate the different solutions in the maritime world. So let us welcome Mr. Jeremy Nixon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's an honour and a pleasure to be back at Block Seventy One for the coffee chat. I always enjoy coming here, and getting a cup of coffee. And uh, also to see so many uh, colleagues, friends, uh, people that we're working together with on various projects, and also just frankly sharing what's going on in our industry and uh, helping each other as much to kind of clear the fog out of the way and try to give some visualization uh, as, as to where things are going. I, I do apologize. Uh, I, I'm a, thank you very much. I, I'm a container shipping guy, so it's, it's, it's containers today. Um, uh, shipping, as you know, is a very diverse and wide industry uh, with many other types of carriers and bu uh, bulks and different commodities. So um, maybe I'll just kick off with this picture and say that uh, this is uh, very topical for us because uh, we're a, a, a Japanese company, but we're actually based here in Singapore. That's our global head office. And actually, we're just based down at the Marina One uh, office here in, in Singapore and Mora Bay area. So, it's kind of uh, one of our sh new ships coming into, with a new branding coming into Singapore. And we're very proud of our Singapore involvement. Um, at a glance, yeah, uh, officially our name is Ocean Network Express, but we actually quickly abbreviate that to one. And one, for a number of reasons, we are actually three companies that have come together, three legacy companies, originally K-Line, MOL, and NYK, and we need to create a new brand. Uh, and, and we felt that one was appropriate in terms of being uh, relatively easy to remember, but secondly, to also uh, represent the three different companies coming together. In terms of scale and size, uh, the container shipping industry has gone through rapid consolidation, particularly since the Lehman crisis back in 2007, 2008. And uh, essentially, we're down to now about uh, 10 major players in the global, global market. Uh, we're currently positioned at number six. Uh, we have just under 7% market share globally. We're in 120 countries in the world. And uh, we operate about 250 container ships. Uh, we have about uh, 1.5 million containers uh, in terms of our fleet. And we're doing about 12 million TU a year. And I think just maybe a key point to put about just to mention here on container shipping is when, when we look out the window, we see the container terminals here in Singapore, we think very much of it as an ocean business. And it is, of course, an ocean business. But those containers are going inland. And therefore, you have to think about that in terms of our customers and the digitalization and the realization <coughs> that we're not just handling the visibility and operations at sea, we're also doing a lot of inland activity. So for example, you might have picked up about the bad weather in North America. Well, we, we do about 100,000 TU a week in and out of North America, but actually we have at any one time about 400,000 TU inland in North America on the railroads, on the trucks, in all of those 52 states, battling through the weather, trying to get through and handle and, and deliver products uh, on, on just-in-time basis. So it's, it's not just 
about the ocean. It's about the total interface, but it's also about the inlands. And that's where all our customers, DCs, warehouses, and manufacturing supply areas are. In terms of core values, I think these are you know, relatively common amongst many of our companies and across many of what we try to do. I think we all try to be uh, a reliable partner, customer satisfaction, and innovation and quality. Those are our four external values. We have a particular trust on innovation. And uh, in terms of internal teamwork, obviously best practice, challenging mindset, and a lean and agile organization. And when we say innovation, we're very much thinking about the customer experience. How do we try to innovate in the supply chain to make our customers' business easier and, and be more creative to help them, obviously. And that, that, that's, I think, true of all of us in this room. In terms of the industry, um, as I say, container shipping has gone through this massive consolidation. It's largely been a story of scale, uh, taking over and consolidating brands, consolidating operations, and reducing the number of players. And that's helped to drive down cost and uh, get greater procurement saving. But we're kind of running out of runway on that, quite frankly. And uh, what we have to deal now with is all, all the container shipping companies is really these three key dynamics or problem issues that we have to deal with. One is market demand. Um, essentially, historically, our supply chains were based around a one-week uh, replenishment cycle. Uh, that's now come down into a daily replenishment cycle for the automotive. And as we move into e-commerce now, it's into an hourly fulfillment process. So we have to think about uh, shorter lead times and uh, flowing the freight much more uniformly uh, on a daily and on an hourly basis as opposed to just in weekly chunks. Uh, secondly, um, it's not just the container shipping industry, uh, container operators that are, are working in this space now. Uh, many of our original customers, freight forwarders, are still our customers, but they are now also offering 3PL and 4PL services, end-to-end uh, -end solutions for container shipping. And in addition to that, uh, the e-retailers, uh, e people like Amazon, Alibaba, etc., are also now uh, very, very active in terms of not just looking after their own ocean freight and inland logistics, but also doing that on behalf of their own customers and potentially uh, some of the carrier's customers. <coughs> and then lastly, volatility. Uh, volatility affects all of our businesses. Um, it's not just about the weather. It's not just about fuel prices, etc. It's also to do with differences in trade. And right now, for example, we're in the middle of a very challenging period between uh, China and the US on the trade tariff issue. And that is going to have quite significant changes to the way that uh, supply chains are engineered over the next one, two, three, four years, and our ability to absorb and change uh, the way that we work our ships, our container terminals, our inland operations to adapt to potential changes in sourcing. So digital transformation, I think for, for most industries and for certainly most of the container shipping companies, the, the, the reason we're doing it is twofold. One is to provide, obviously, benefits to the customer as a way of differentiation, um, a way of trying to improve and make our services look better and be more enticing uh, than, than our competitors. Um, and secondly, to also improve our own operational uh, scale and, and uh, efficiency. Um, container shipping companies, as I say, are, are very large entities. Um, you know, we're, we're doing 12 million TU a year. Maersk is doing over 20 million TU a year. But just for us, if we can get you know, a 1% improvement in our utilization of our assets, that's close to 50 million US dollars improvement in the EBITDA on the bottom line. So you're dealing with very, very large volumes, very, very large scale. And if you can improve the efficiency in any of these areas, um, it has very significant improvements to the bottom line. So it is all about being proactive. It's about also providing a better uh, e-platform, doing more, more web-based interaction with your customers, and trying to reduce down the size of your onshore uh, staff uh, 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 and, and offices, and also trying to rationalize and improve your back office operations. And you could say that uh, in terms of low-hanging fruit through to the high-hanging fruit, um, we're, we're on this journey of digitalization. And we started off uh, on, on the short-term area which is current at the moment, which is you know working on our EDI connectivity, working on our web-based, trying to push as much as we can for e-messaging through the EDI platform. We do about 80,000 EDI messages a day. 
uh, nearly the great majority of our bookings, majority of our documentation uh, is all, was all done through EDI connections. All our um, interaction with our service suppliers, with our vendors, railroads, trucks, uh, container terminals, off dock CYs, uh, ships, is all done through largely EDI messaging. And then as we move up the scale, uh, we're now moving into the area of robotics, and we are doing, we've moved a number of processes from manual, uh, and, 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 and simplifying those manual processes. Now in the back office in particular, we're looking at how we can use robotics to, uh, to make those processes, back end of processes more efficient, and, and speed things up. We're moving largely to cloud-based systems. Um, one of the uh, challenges, but also one of the benefits of, of a big bang integration that we just did as one was that nearly all of our systems are now in the cloud. We were able to set that up from, from, from the very start of the company eight months ago. Um, most shipping companies are running some quite old legacy systems. They are transferring obviously to global systems and they will increasingly move to cloud as well. And the more that we are all working on cloud, then the more opportunities there is to, to interact with each other and provide better quality data. Intelligent automation is also coming in now. Um, there's a number of areas where we're doing that. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we are looking at uh, stowage planning. So uh, those 250 ships, we have to stow those in every port, import, export, move empties on and off, and how to optimize those ships, uh, as they're calling them, for example, here in Singapore. And the sequence of which you put the containers on board is actually quite complex. And uh, again, a, a good ship planner uh, can get two, three, four percent more efficiency out of the ship. That's a lot of additional cargo and contribution you can put to the bottom line. Uh, now we've got uh, some automation coming in now, which allows us to do a lot more uh, predictability and, and, and what if options uh, in terms of how we stow the ship in much faster time, and we can make quicker decisions, which allow us to get much higher levels of, of, of efficiency. So uh, recently we, we, we set a couple of records here with the PSA where our, our larger ships uh, were loading uh, just over 19,000 TU uh, in a single uh, departure call, which is a, a kind of a record. And quite frankly, um, that was down to the use of, of automation stowage, uh, helping to guide the planning team to make quicker, faster, better decisions. <coughs> IoT, uh, IoTs throughout our lives, uh, through our consumer products, but it's also very much uh, coming alive in the container shipping industry. And uh, the most uh, obvious area that that can be used is really with the individual container. Uh, there's 175 million containers a year moving around the world. And uh, a lot of those rely on EDI message sets to explain where the container is, wh what was the last gateway it went through. Uh, IoT, if we can actually put the IoT into the box, that allows us to get real-time tracking on the container but also real-time tracking in terms of what's inside the container and how it's behaving. So the big move now by the container shipping companies is into the reefer containers, and putting the IoT device into the reefer container, which allows us to monitor the reefer uh, uh, performance of the, of the actual container, uh, allows us to predict if there's some problems happening with machinery, but it also allows us to change the settings of the container in terms of the temperature control or the gas mix within the reefer containers as, as it's on its, uh, progressing on its journey. Uh, Machine-based automation, yeah, um, we, we're obviously looking at driverless cars, and that's very relevant to this area around, around here. Um, driverless ships, probably quite a long way away from that, but certainly developing a lot of um, tools and automated devices which can assist uh, the, the crew on the ships to make big, better, smarter decisions, and therefore potentially uh, mean that we can have less crew on the ships. So, an area of that may be, for example, uh, uh, a tool which automatically is calculating collision risks for ships and can alert the uh, officer of the watch much more quickly about particular risks. Um, yeah, and uh, collaboration platforms. Uh, a lot of talk about blockchain these days in the industry across the supply chain and uh, uh, a number of developments going on this year with, with, with uh, blockchain. And uh, that's probably you know, a, a, a longer term development, but it's something that we uh, all need to progress and work together and collaborate on to try and create a, a future blockchain for the container shipping and supply chain industry. So in short, we're looking for short term low hanging fruit is uh, operational efficiency, uh, customer connectivity, and the ability to use the data 
for better analysis work, um, speeding up decision making, uh, grouping a lot of that data, operational data, bringing it forward in, in applications or, or, or management reporting systems which allow the operator, whether they're on the bridge of the ship, uh, whether they're in the container terminal, whether they're in front of the customer, uh, to be able to make better, smarter, quicker decisions. And then longer term, um, much more digital collaboration. Uh, I think uh, historically shipping lines have tended to act rather individually. Um, as, as, as one, you know, with a, a market share of just under 7%, there's only so much that we can roll out uh, within our own network of influence. Uh, we will need to work with other shipping companies, uh, other, other transportation companies, other, other logistics companies to build collaboration in the future. Uh, whether it's on the API side, whether it's on the blockchain side. And a key thrust of that is to get standardization across the industry. And we recently took part and we're joining uh, an initiative with the top five, top five out of the top six carriers globally to set up a container shipping association which will aim to uh, standardize the uh, Which is uh, aimed at trying to set common standards across the container shipping industry, uh, whether it's EDI, API, it's blockchain, so that um, when we are developing uh, applications or software, uh, we know exactly what standards or formats to work to, and therefore our, our customers and, and also all our uh, other partners or stakeholders in the industry can also work on that on the same basis. And that way we can try to encourage more uh, companies to come into the industry and, and, and build solutions with us on, on a standardized platform approach. Preventative maintenance, yes, uh, that's another area. Uh, we, we talked briefly about what we could do with the individual containers uh, and, 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 and help with the maintenance of the reefer container, but we're also doing a lot of work now in the future aimed at uh, the machinery on the ships and how we can try to, to minimize um, plan maintenance and move much more towards uh, maintenance as of when it's actually really required. And then lastly, yeah, intelligent work streams, uh, analytics, uh, AI, uh, these, these are the areas that uh, you know, we're going to try and work on and bring a lot of that uh, knowledge and, and work and know-how which is taking place in many other industries and try and bring that into the container shipping business as well. So I'm going to close out and uh, that's just a, a kickoff. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview of some of the issues and dynamics that are going on. As you can probably tell, I'm not an IT specialist, but I have uh, worked through my involvement um, with the launch of one and previously in other shipping companies. I think in the executive boardroom now, we have to be far, far more involved and engaged on this digital journey. And uh, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to work across as an industry. Uh, we need to work with our competitors, but we also need to work as much as possible with a lot of the new ideas that are coming through uh, from other industries and see how we can apply that technology into the container shipping industry. So thank you very much. I look forward to joining the rest of the panel and some case studies and your questions later. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So now let me introduce you to Harako San from SCS, who will share more about the review of 2018 as well as the opportunities of the O3 Challenge 2019 and how you can participate. So in addition, uh, Hakobo, which is a maritime startup, will also be sharing with us some of the, their technologies and how they digitalize the entire shipping experience. Haruko san oh. uh, Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Haraoka, uh, working for Symphony Creative Solution. And uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, Coffee Chat Deep Dive. This event is a part of an Ocean Opportunity Program. And this program is a jointly organized with Ocean Network Express, MS Enterprise, and Symphony Creative Solutions for the uh, open innovation uh, for the uh, shipping and logistics industry. Mm. Uh, today, uh, let me introduce our, uh, uh, let me introduce briefly about our journey uh, since last year. Okay, uh, 
our office is in block 71 uh, 0103 so uh, anytime if you are uh, uh, interested in uh, please uh, uh, visit our office and we are kind of a catalyst uh, creating a value for the uh, shipping and uh, uh, logistics industry and together with uh, block 71 and MS enterprise uh, we are working closely uh, collaboratively uh, uh, with uh, uh, startup companies so now uh, we have uh, five startups outside uh, for the showcase and some of them are uh, finance of our uh, Ocean of Opportunity in 2018. And also, uh, some of the startups uh, we are now uh, currently uh, working together. Mm. Also, uh, we are working uh, together with uh, uh, maritime industry, maritime community, uh, participating as a co creator uh, to uh, Smart Four Challenge 2017 and uh, uh, 18. Uh, to uh, working to, uh, closely with uh, MPA and the PR 71. Also, uh, same as today's event, uh, we, will con uh, we have conducted uh, four copy chats last year. Then uh, we ran our, our own program, uh, Ocean of Opportunities, uh, partner with uh, uh, ONE and NS Enterprise. And uh, some other technology companies uh, 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 support our uh, program. <coughs> this is our uh, uh, schedule uh, last year, uh, not this year. <laughs> so uh, this, uh, uh, take note. this is the last one. Okay, uh, we have uh, several uh, road shows at Block 71 and SZ Innovate uh, to explain uh, the uh, seven challenge statement. Uh, uh, and also, uh, we have a final pitch event at uh, uh, InnoFest Unbound, one of the uh, biggest uh, startup events in Southeast Asia. So, uh, these are uh, uh, challenge statements uh, provided uh, from uh, uh, actual uh, operational uh, pain points from ONE. And also, uh, we launch a uh, 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 program and uh, uh, do the uh, uh, boot camps uh, uh, like that. Uh, one uh, at Block 71 and uh, one road show at SG Nobel. Actually, we had uh, about 50 submissions uh, for our challenge last year, and uh, we selected uh, 10 finalists. And uh, all these <coughs> startups had a chance to uh, uh, have a pitch at uh, 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 InnoFest Unbound. And some of the startups uh, uh, had a uh, booth uh, outside. So uh, if you have a time, please uh, drop at the uh, booth as well. So uh, at the in, uh, uh, InnoFest Unbound, uh, we have a pitch event, and also uh, we have an exhibition booth. Uh, not only uh, showing uh, our uh, uh, company and uh, only uh, uh, explanation introduction, uh, we have uh, a startup showcase uh, for uh, 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 at uh, uh, Innofest and Bank. This is a pitch session. Uh, judgment uh, uh, three three from ONE, one from uh, government, and one from uh, uh, academy. Uh, we judge uh, uh, the, uh, and. Uh, Award uh, the uh, three uh, three top teams. So uh, we have a, a ceremony at uh, ONE headquarters, and also uh, we have a, a boot camp together with the top three D startups. So uh, uh, what's next? Uh, this is very important part, uh, especially for the uh, for potential uh, uh, participants. Okay. Uh, Next event, uh, we have a boot camp, uh, we have a, a road show, and a, a, a second talk event at Block 71 on 15th of March. Please schedule uh, uh, this event. And uh, uh, after that, uh, we will have a, a design thinking session with uh, potential uh, uh, participants. Uh, uh, pot uh, and uh, 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 mid April, uh, we will have a second road show. And the venue is not yet uh, confirmed, and uh, we will uh, uh, update the uh, information uh, through uh, our uh, website. 
and uh, uh, Nick May, uh, we will have a dead one. And uh, Lake May, uh, we will have a uh, shortlist selection and uh, announce the uh, finalist for the uh, 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 pitch event. Same as last year, uh, we will have uh, a final pitch at uh, InnoFest Unbound. And uh, this is scheduled on 26th of June this year. Then uh, Booth Camp uh, will start after uh, July. Uh, this is a uh, 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 schedule uh, for this uh, uh, year. So if you are interested in uh, this uh, event, please uh, uh, register uh, to uh, our uh, Facebook page. Uh, we will uh, keep updating the information uh, about all three programs. Mm. And uh, this is a QR code. Uh, you can uh, scan the QR code and uh, jump to the uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, registration form. And also there's uh, 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 same information uh, uh, everywhere uh, on the world. Please uh, check the uh, uh, code. Thank you very much. And uh, before uh, we move to the uh, exciting <coughs> panel discussion, uh, let me introduce one of the uh, panelists uh, from uh, Hakobo, uh, Mr. Shari, uh, to uh, uh, introduce their uh, solution. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, since I'm holding you back from the exciting part, I'm going to be quite disciplined about this. Um, I'll tell you what Hakobo does, I'll tell you what I do, and then I'll share why is Hakobo here. So, what does Hakobo do? Um, since last year, we've actually evolved. Uh, we were talking about digitalizing ocean freight, but now we digitalize cross-border trade. Um, why do I say that? When we first started out, we were a B2B e-marketplace where you could get in, search, compare, and book ocean freight. Uh, and we focused on getting our partners from China and freight forwarders getting their cargo into ASEAN. Along the way, we found uh, that doesn't solve the problem. There's still the inland problem that Jeremy mentioned. And for our partners, right, too much choice is a bad thing. You know, every container you come in, you work with a different forwarder. So what happened? Hakobo went into digital forwarding for port to door in ASEAN. So when it comes to our partners, look, you talk to Hakobo uh, and we t use your volumes and we then focus on getting your cargo from the port to the final delivery. Then guess what? At, apart from Singapore, in ASEAN, it takes too long and costs too much to clear customs. So then we started doing global trade management. Uh, from the data that we get from our partners in China, at the point when they do export, we can start the import process. And since December, we started with China. Uh, sorry, we started with Indonesia. Uh, why Indonesia? Well, naturally. Um, we didn't want to go to Philippines because it was too much of a cowboy town. Uh, so uh, since December, we've been able to actually start the import process before the vessel arrives. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with our last shipment. Uh, the uh, ship, the vessel actually uh, left Siamen, transit Hong Kong with a Form E, and for those having shipping, you know that's a problem. But when it arrived in uh, Jakarta on a Sunday evening, the cargo was ready to go out of the port on Monday. And in fact, after the, car, the container arrived at the uh, final destination on Tuesday, it stayed there for 10 days because the consignee was expecting it to take 15 days before it gets there. Uh, so that's what we do. Um, we focus on finding out where the problems are and solving those solutions rather than being stuck with one solution and one technology. So what do I do? I, I'm the CDO. Uh, what my boss tells me to do is that go out there find business opportunities that can be enabled by technology. And, and we're a small company where we're pretty hard-nosed about what we do. You know, we don't go out and experiment on everything. So what I do is, uh, where are the, pro the biggest problems that our customers face? And for the biggest problems that our customers face, what costs them the most? And for those problems that cost our customers the most, which solution can we can we, as Hakobo, generate the greatest value out of? So, really hard news. So, why is Hakobo here? Um, in the company, still small company, uh, there's a Japanese, a Hong Konger, a Singaporean, uh, an Indonesian, an Indian, and very soon there'll be a Sri Lankan. Uh, together, there's about 110 years of shipping experience, but we don't know everything. And that's why this is important. Uh, folks like uh, Jeremy, from what he shared, there are other folks here who are from shipping. 
they will share with us what their problems are. And they are the customers. So I really solved two problems. Who are the customers? What's the biggest problems they have? And now I just have to figure out, if I provide a solution, which, uh, which solution can I get the greatest value of? And when we participated in Triple O last year, um, what we found was a platform where we could interact with people in shipping, find out what we didn't know, and even for things that we knew, we could find out people who could potentially be either our partners and our customers. So for those of you with an idea, or looking for an idea to solve, uh, stick around. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sahil. So now, before we begin the final panel discussion, let me introduce you Dr. Sanjay, Executive Director of the Singapore Maritime Institute to share with us some of his expert opinion on the maritime landscape. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for giving me this chance just to share some thoughts on R&D. Um, Singapore Maritime Institute, first thing, is a, a company set up by MPA, so a CLG under MPA. And our mandate is really to fund research uh, through the universities, the polytechnics and the RIs for the maritime sector specifically. The challenge for R&D is this. A lot of the problem statements, even the ones you saw, tend to be very tactical. That means these are problems of having now, right? But R&D is trying to solve a problem that's going to appear in three, five years' time from now, or even beyond that. So for ability to actually define problem statements ahead is actually a big challenge. And I think this is what we try to do uh, every day by talking to the industry and trying to predict what are the problems you're going to face so that R&D can actually then create the foundation of uh, knowledge that startups can use to kind of uh, springboard from, right? So that you shorten the uh, life cycle on innovation. So this is, and this is funded by the government, right? So this is where you may not get your returns tomorrow, but hopefully when it comes out, the returns will come faster. So the big challenge for us is, having done this, SMI has been around since 2011. We funded about 102 projects. The challenge now is how do we actually communicate the outcomes from those projects to industry and say we already got this body of information that can be used quickly and this is what we are trying to do now and I think you'll see a lot more this year happening and I think um, we are also going through this process of re-looking at the R&D roadmap from the maritime sector which was announced in 2012 so you will have some new information on how we see where the challenges are faced by the maritime community and that's really been through workshops and a bottom-up approach with both industry and the uh, IHLs. So I think O3 is one of those other things that's happening, right? The platform for collaboration is being established. The platform to understand problem statements are being established. So it's really to contextualize the amount of effort and resource, both money and time, and people's aspirations to come together to create the impact on a sector that really desperately needs to change. Uh, although they say maritime has been a laggard in the whole uh, digital transformation, but it actually is one of the uh, plus points is you can actually leverage Industry 4.0. You can leverage the, the entire IoT technology, you can leverage blockchain technology and move faster with those changes. So we hope that platforms like this and SMI uh, together with MPA can actually create that uh, ecosystem where problem statements are shared so that we can find a uh, solution. So we're really looking at collaborative impact going forward. So I really look forward to the panel discussion and I think uh, a lot more can be uh, taken up from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay. So now is the long-awaited panel discussion. So we would like to welcome our panelists for the final segment today. May we invite Mr. Jeremy Nixon again? Mr. Thomas Ting, Deputy Director, Research Technology and Industry De Development at Maritime Port of Authority, Singapore, and Mr. Sahil, the Chief Digital Officer of Hakobo, as well as our moderator for this session, Mr. Kelvin Tan, Director of NUS Enterprise. May we also invite you to participate in this discussion with us by logging on to www.pigeonhole.at and enter the passcode COPYCHAT to pose your questions while our moderator will ask them for you. Thank you. Thanks.
Felicia. Um, thank you again, gentlemen, for coming. Uh, Thomas, uh, you missed out the opportunity to see some, uh, you know, uh, introduction of MPA. So uh, maybe I can start with you to, you know, uh, give a quick landscape uh, of the maritime since the last time we met uh, for O3 last year. What do you think? Uh, has the climate improved or uh, has uh, technology been uh, still pretty slow as a laggard in uh, the shipping line? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting to this platform. Uh, last year, I also spoke on the same occasion, the uh, coffee chat. And uh, I must uh, say, uh, probably I'll introduce uh, our MPA first. Uh, the Maritime and Port Authority uh, is basically a regulator for the port and maritime industry in Singapore. Uh, but at the same time, we also play the role as a promoter for industry development and trying to develop the maritime and port ecosystem in Singapore. And they're also representative at the international maritime organizations uh, promoting Singapore's interests. And uh, in terms of uh, promoting industry development, uh, the industry transformation map uh, that the uh, MPA uh, working together with the shipping associations and industry partners uh, that was launched uh, one and a half years ago, uh, articulate the strategy for us uh, to the year 2025, uh, which encapsulate uh, the strategies for developing our next generation port uh, for stalling uh, the future growth in the uh, global trade uh, as well as the vessels come to port of Singapore and also uh, in creating an enabling environment to transform the industries um, not only in strengthening the existing players in Singapore in terms of the shipping, port, maritime services and the marine offshore industry but also trying to inject new bloods into this, uh, uh, this cluster which means these are the maritime technology companies and the startups play a very important role in this uh, in this strategy. Um, so in this uh, industry transformation map, uh, we actually created uh, a couple of uh, platforms uh, for companies to actually uh, connect and uh, innovate. Uh, one of it uh, is of course uh, working with uh, forward thinking companies like uh, uh, O and E, uh, which are very heartened that uh, they have created their own corporate incubation arms, uh, working with uh, startups and uh, also other platforms like Pearson and One, which is also an uh, aggregator platform, um, looking at how we can uh, help companies to post their challenge statements globally and uh, try to attract the best ideas uh, from, from Singapore as well as overseas in solving some of these uh, problems, and also the creation of the MPA leading that, and of course uh, the, the setup of the Center of Excellence within uh, the uh, Singapore institutions uh, within NUS, NTU, and uh, Singapore Poly to defend some of the R&D capabilities. So these are all some of these key strategies that uh, we have uh, worked out and now it's in the execution uh, phase of the development. And uh, I think in, in terms of the uh, in terms of the workshops that were conducted, uh, we understand that the staff, uh, for the maritime sector, there's a, a lot of challenges for the staff to penetrate. It's uh, multiple reasons. One is, the, of course, the lack of understanding of the business domain, which is uh, it's very challenging because it's not like retail or other sectors where it's, it's every day you are dealing with that. You understand the business. But in the maritime industry, whether it's in the terminal operation business, in the bunkering, refueling business, supplying provisions to the ship, the ship operations, it's so deep. Some of these, the staff simply, they may have a solution that's relevant to them, but they don't know how to penetrate this customer. So what we are creating under these uh, platforms uh, is actually to bring out all these corporate corporate uh, companies uh, that are based in Singapore. It can be Singapore company or Singapore based company. Uh, create a circle of digital officers, creating workshops, gathering all the high impact problem statements. So last year we had uh, 17 companies that participated and uh, co contributing their problem statements, sharpening over design thinking workshops, similar to the one that uh, Ocean uh, O3 had and uh, trying to open up the doors of these demand drivers to the startups. So uh, then it creates the door for the startups to assess the problem uh, statement generator and uh, becomes a pilot user for their solutions. So this, this is just some uh, a quick introduction of uh, the, the platforms that we are working with uh, industry players um, to create opportunities for the startups to enter into the maritime space and to accelerate the digitalization process. Uh, Okay, thanks. So, in short, you are very happy with the progress, but more work can, can be done uh, because there's so much opportunity, right, uh, if I may sum it up. 
Uh, I will move over to uh, Jeremy then. Um, you seem satisfied, you know, a year old, older <laughs> after we met uh, at the launch of O3. Um, there's also a very impressive report card you showed there in terms of uh, technology adoption and also, I guess, uh, the, the shift uh, in thinking and culture uh, that a, a traditional maritime or shipping company or containerization company uh, is, uh, you know, being perceived as. Um, so would you like to uh, share with us uh, your sentiment you know, uh, of uh, working with a startup and maybe give some examples uh, a few startups that you really like, what they do. Yeah, thank you, Kelvin. Um, yeah, I think one year greyer, <laughs> having having just gone through a major integration. But uh, yeah, we're we're uh, nearly nearly completed our first year of operation. Um, yeah, I, I mean uh, the the container shipping industry is um, it's about uh, forty five years old now. Um, and it's a uh, it's a very very significant part of the world economy. Um, you know, we 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 are a servant of the trade. We we, we support a lot of global trade, and there are, you know, we have about fifty thousand customers that, that we're working with. And so across across the industry, uh, there's probably you know two or three million customers out there who are trading. And uh, one of the great benefits of containerization is that, you know, it, it's gone down that concept of standardization almost too much in terms of uh, most of our competitors, we're, we're all very commoditized, you know, we, we use the, the same ship design and the same container design, uh, we use the, go to the same container terminals, uh, we use the same type of trucks, the same type of, 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 of rail. So we're actually very commoditized and um, you could say that we're the kind of um, we're the kind of hardware side of, of, of the software side in terms of it's pretty standard. So then standardizing um, the way that we work across the industry uh, from a digital standpoint, the software industry, I think is it, it, it's a great starting place. And, and uh, you know, there's trade going on in 120 to 150 countries in the world. And we do have, um, uh, Thomas mentioned, you know, the, the, the IMO, International Maritime Organization, we do have global government uh, classification societies or regulators which are trying to standardize as much as possible globally so that the whole global uh, container trade and operations will flow in a uniform way. So that's a great opportunity um, for people that want to come in and try and work within our industry because whatever solution you come up with, um, it could be valuable to, to many, many players very, very quickly. Um, in terms of providing a, a uniform solution to, to, to those difficulties. But one of the problems we found is, is trying to encourage startups to understand the problem statements, and I think they're very good at doing that. But when they actually come to come up with a solution, they're a bit worried that uh, you know, there needs to be more standardization across the industry in terms of formats and protocols, so that if they do develop something, it's not just captive to the to the shipping company they're working with. It could actually be valuable right across the many countries and, and many other shipping companies. And I think that's why we're very keen to work with uh, Maersk, um, NSC, uh, CMA, uh, Hapagoid, uh, to develop um, this, this standardization association so that uh, in the future, whether we're looking at blockchain, we're looking at electronic bills of lading, we're looking at EDI, we're looking at API messaging, etc. We can try to go to one standardization, standardized format globally across the world to make it much better for the app developers and software companies to come in and support that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Before I, um, you know, throw the question out to the floor or you know some of those uh, highly voted questions on pigeonhole, uh, I think I should also give uh, Takri a chance since uh, you know uh, Jeremy mentioned about standardization and you actually get right into the thick of action, right? Talking to Indonesia, for example, right? Uh, a country that uh, may not have the same standard as Singapore in terms of some of the paperwork, the clear customs. So would you li would like to uh, talk about uh, how you, uh, for the last one year, managed to circumvent and take on these challenges and uh, rise above uh, water and grief? <laughs> okay, um, since last year, I, I think if you saw my pictures in Haraoka slides, you see I've lost all my hair. <laughs> um, 
when, when it comes to customs, uh, there's, there's good and bad. Uh, I just like IMO for, for Maritime, there is a World Customs Organization. And in the World Customs Organization, there is a standard data model uh, which they drive across all countries. Uh, having said that, uh, depending on the state of adoption in that country, uh, there are issues uh, in terms of slight variances. So, yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's an open secret. Everybody else does, does it. Right? Every company will actually have their own standard and then try to find a way to interoperate with different countries' standards. And, and that's, that's the way that we, that we approach it. Um, I think the, the, the thing I wanted to point out uh, is, again, what I mentioned just now, um, as, as for solution providers, um, do not get seduced by the technology. Uh, you are out there to solve the customer's problem. Uh, is the customer interested whether you're using uh, blockchain, uh, EDI, API? No, solve his problem. Uh, the technology, that's uh, your IP. Uh, and, and that's how we approach it from, from Okay, thank you so much. So, um, but, so I've uh, um, requested uh, Thomas to take the first question as an honor. Um, you know, we have AI in healthcare, AI in everything. So definitely AI in maritime. I'm sure this is not new to you. Uh, but you think uh, what are the you know sort of actual implementation you seen, and where are still the gaps are not filled up uh, in your point of view for maritime? So uh, based on my observation, I mean AI is a very big topic. Right? There are a lot of uh, sub fields within uh, AI and analytics and machine learning and all that. Um, but in the area of, uh, first uh, maybe I'll talk about ships first. Uh, the trend uh, in the shipping is definitely going to smarter, more connected ships. Uh, it's an inevitable trend. A lot of experts have projected different timelines, 2025, 2030, 2035, Rolls-Royce and Rosslers have made their own projections. So it's a matter of time before the ship become uh, achieving higher level of autonomy. And uh, autonomous ship naturally needs all these uh, artificial intelligence uh, to operate in the future. So, uh, would they go to remote control or to fully autonomous? Uh, by what time? We, we don't know. But uh, whether some of this AI that are already practiced in the, uh, in, the, in the airlines and the land uh, industries can be cross applicable, maybe some of these are relevant. But of course, the domain specifics uh, still has to be worked on. Um, as, as even as I speak now, um, we are already um, working with a few companies who are interested to try out autonomous vessels in our port waters. Um, I'm talking about hovercrafts first and uh, ocean vessels uh, next. Um, hovercraft is easier because it's within the national jurisdiction. So what it means is that uh, I don't comply with the national maritime organizations, regulations, it's not safety and all, the, all those stuff, waiting for the whole international community to agree on the standards. Uh, just through MPA, uh, by demonstrating that uh, your uh, autonomous vessels or remote vessels are safe, uh, firstly, through uh, simulation modeling and all those things, you know, uh, do some benchmarking, then putting them into the regulatory sandbox for physical testing, and finally putting them under different physical scenarios of testing. That's all within Singapore's control. And uh, Singapore being one of the most congested um, ports in the world, uh, that, is, that is really a crown jewel here because a lot of uh, companies, technology companies, uh, Rolls Royce, Watsoners, and so many of them, they actually wanted to test in Singapore is because ocean going vessels from one place or another in the ocean lake, open ocean, very easy. I mean, how many uh, ships are you going to encounter in, in the ocean? That, that navigation is pretty straightforward. They just need good AI for weather routing, overcoming, you know, best, to achieve the best fuel performance and uh, uh, avoiding some of the risk area. I think that's pretty straightforward. But coming to the port is a different matter because the vessels have different level of autonomy and how do you Man, unmanned vessels, remote control vessels, small crowd, and all of them have different maneuver uh, characteristics. And that's where the AI uh, companies have a lot of opportunities to work with some of these um, players, I would say, um, to come with solutions, uh, including the vessel owners, of course. Uh, the other area where uh, it's uh, of course big opportunities uh, is in the terminal and port area, you know, in terms of how the uh, automations of the future port operations is going to be. Um, how the key cranes, the uh, horizontal transport, the yard side is going to be automated. Uh, so um, these are just some of the big areas. Of course, the, the smaller companies like agencies and all those things, the smaller AIs that are up to or they will still be uh, highly relevant in the near term. Jeremy, do you want to have any comments on this and also um, you know, 
the other question about cost, cost and cost. I think the emphasis is uh, on uh, how you know, technologies like AI uh, have seen, uh, are we impatient and have, uh, have we waited enough uh, to see the cost savings uh, from technology? Right. So two questions there, one is AI and one is cost. Yeah, I think on the AI, um, you know, if you take a container shipping, ship like that up there today, you showed on the slides, plus all the cargo on board, you're, you're looking at probably about close to one billion US dollars. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to, a lot at stake if it goes wrong. The AI goes wrong. And, um, you know, we have very, very professional deck officers who do a very, very good job managing the ships today. So, um, how much money are you going to really save by substituting them with an AI solution? And you'll have to build a lot of redundancy into your uh, design of your ships uh, to, to a backup of a backup of a backup to avoid uh, have, having an accident. I think the really interesting one is the inland. Uh, there's a global shortage of trucking. Um, every country you go to in the world, generally, people don't want to do trucking anymore. Um, so I think the whole AI side around cars is great, but the really big one could be around trucks. Again, of course, that's a very key issue about safety and, 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 and etc. But um, that, 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 I think, could be far, far more interesting for the container shipping market. Could be the ability to, to, to do the AI on the trucking side and the land side. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, not dismissing it, but as you saw on the graph, kind of pushing it a bit up as a high hanging fruit as, a, as opposed to a low hanging fruit. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, for Sakura, I'm sure one of your key calling cards when you sell is, is cheaper, right? In order to, uh, to go automation, automation and uh, this uh, digital clearance. Uh, is, is that one of your biggest uh, MVPs when you uh, approach uh, the different customs? Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I just want to echo what, what Jeffrey mentioned about inland, right? Um, the official in Indonesian statistics is that a container takes 4.6 days to clear the port, uh, which means that officially there's 4.6 days of containers in the port, which means the, the port is 4.6 times bigger than it should be. Uh, so when and you know uh, when it comes to uh, cargo clearance, you're talking about data that's actually about the cargo in the container and everything is transactional so when you have all this transactional data and you can actually put AI into it can you actually improve uh, the risk management uh, the uh, clearance process such that you reduce the dwell time that's actually at the port so that's that's a big winner down there uh, um, you know I think uh, uh, PSA and, and MP has done a good job uh, the port is smaller than it should be can you imagine if we took 4.6 days, the whole of Singapore is the port. Uh, so, yes, there's always an opportunity for AI, uh, not just into uh, managing the hardware, but managing the data that actually supports the trade. Right, thank you. Okay, now I'll give a chance to anyone who would like to raise their hand uh, and ask any of the panelists here a question. Okay, that's one uh, gentleman there. Uh, maybe you can... Can you identify yourself? Sure, uh, Michael from uh, Rainmaker Ventures. And so, so I think the cost drive is, 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 is obvious, right? Everybody needs to drive cost. I think one of the things that we're not seeing much is uh, how do you drive top line? How do you drive more uh, revenue? And so maybe a question to, uh, to Jeremy on this one. Uh, what are you doing in uh, one to, yeah, to get more top line? Thank you, Michael. Um, good, very good question. Uh, I would say, um, generally, for the last 10 years, uh, container shipping carriers have been price takers and not price makers. Um, that may or may not change in the next 10 years. So if, if the market rates are largely uh, driven by supply and demand factors and uh, the customer, then it's, it, it comes really back to the yield management. And uh, that's, that's a very, very, very strong focus in the industry. It's certainly a very, very strong focus in our shop is to look at the, the yield management. So every single container is uh, like a mini ship. We're moving it from A to B. Um, it, ha it has a certain customer in there with a certain contract, a certain level of revenue, and it incurs a certain variable cost as we move it across that point to point between continents. 
And it's our ability to um, ascertain what that yield is um, as accurate as possible, and then to optimize the different uh, customers and cargo opportunities we've got so that when we actually sail the vessel, uh, the vessel isn't just full, but it's actually optimized in terms of having the best yielding cargo on board. So, so at the moment, we're looking at it more as a yield management issue. But what you can see is that a, a number of our competitors are, are moving potentially up the value chain of wanting to get involved in the more the 3PL area, try to add more value-added services, uh, looking to provide customs clearance, looking to provide uh, not just carrier haulage, which we, we do today, trucking and, and rail, but also looking to do warehousing solutions, uh, uh, su supply chain solutions as well. And that's where Maersk is going now very much with their 3PL model. Um, that's where uh, CMA is now looking to go with SIVA. Um, so, you know, th th there you're taking on you're taking on a lot of the, the big 3PL, 4PL logistics companies. I think you've got to be very, very good to compete in that space, to do a good job, to make sure that you are adding to the top line and not just subtracting at the bottom line by, uh, by doing it more inefficiently than other players. But I take your point entirely. Um, we, need, we need to look at the top line. I, I just look at the top line today with my management team we think about yield and maximizing that margin all the time. Thank you. How about, maybe you can also answer this question about uh, <laughs> helping companies to top line. <laughs> Not customers. Uh, <laughs> we, we focus on our top line. <laughs> 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 um, I, I think as, uh, we have certain flexibilities as, as compared to, to any. We, we, we're much a smaller shop. Uh, our, our cost is much lower. Um, and when we deliver value to the customer, it's a lot easier for us to actually uh, generate, not, not the top line, but uh, the, the profitability that we actually generate out of it. So I think that's where when you're a small company and, and you're very focused on solving problems where you can generate the greatest value, that's, that's slightly easier for us. Uh, plus, I think the big difference between us and OM is that we don't own assets. And, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a very big thing off our bottom line. <laughs> uh, my name is Radu Anko. I'm, um, I'm uh, from Morgan Phillips Executive Search. Uh, we, are, we are in the business of people and, and human resources. So I would love to have two questions on the soft skills. Let's, let's put it on the soft skills side. So one, I would be curious to find out, and, and I put the question there, what are the hardest soft and hard skills to recruit in this process of digital transformation? And as a leeway from that question is, also, we talk a lot about technology, right? But how do you get people on board on this journey of digitalization, right? Because you talk a lot about redundancies, replacement, AI, robotics, right? So that means people will be taken out, right? So how do you do that change management in a way that people are on board? So two questions, skills, and how do you get people on board? Okay, I think, uh, I think Thomas can help out for a uh, uh, One of the two questions also. Uh, and, you know, yeah. change management. Yeah, change management, and then, no, I'm, I'm sure the government is talking about retraining and training. Okay, it seems resistant, now, but why don't you start? About people and training and manpower. Yeah, I, I think all the things that government roll out on the reskill, upskill, that one uh, has already been shared in all the media. But uh, about the specific actions that the corporates can take, I think the good example uh, has always been uh, shared with those that are done by PSA, you know, in terms of the automation of the key cranes how to go about this journey. So we actually set up an internal change management program. We also have an academy to help uh, all these staff to actually upgrade their skills from, uh, you know, they, they climb up the cranes and go up there and try to navigate this, which is a very physically laborious uh, job that you know, no young, younger generation don't want to do and they have to uh, start engaging a lot of uh, foreigners to help out. But the automation actually helps to solve the problems. Uh, in that now uh, I'm able to get more Singapore-based uh, people uh, sitting comfortably in the, in the aircon room and trying to use this joystick to, to control the thing or uh, even managing exceptions. Large part of the automation is really done, done at machine, but the managing exceptions and also um, doing the higher value acti acti activity. So um, some of the existing workers, we actually help them to go through this training program, go through a simulator training and um, which helps them to um, take on new jobs. The website supervisor as well, last time they were also handling a lot of manual things and when the things get automated, they go through the same uh, training in the academy uh, to be upgraded. 
Well, I think that part of the assurance the company needs to give the staff is uh, that um, the training is in place, even as I digitalize the process, you will be uh, deployed in a new job function as such. And for those jobs that are uh, old jobs that nobody wants to face, like taking foreigners, of course, these are the good areas that we are happy to let go, right? I mean, um, we, we have quotas on the work permit and all those uh, things. So that is, that is what I observed in some of the successful examples of how companies are able to push through the change management uh, uh, process successfully and, and getting their uh, unions uh, and employees engaged uh, throughout the whole transformation journey. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very, very good point. Um, you could say for the last 15 years, uh, carriers have been desperately trying to cut cost, uh, trying to reduce the size of their onshore uh, offices. Um, a lot of the uh, administration uh, is, is actually quite uh, administrative in terms of you know a lot of bills of labor production, a lot of invoicing, this type of activity. Um, the, the really good thing about this innovation uh, journey we're on together, this digitalized journey we're on together, is that actually we can uh, reduce a lot of those, dare I say, uh, low value add, quite mundane activities and automate those. Um, and actually move the decision making up, up the tree and, and be able to empower more people in our organization so that they are less involved with day-to-day -day administrative tasks are much more involved with uh, using uh, <coughs> applications, uh, reporting, uh, management information to make better, smarter, quicker decisions. Um, so I, I think actually um, I'm quite positive about that and, and, and I think that we have a lot to learn from you guys in terms of um, learning to clarify what are our problem statements internally. And, and, and addressing those uh, and, and trying to find solutions for those either internally or externally. So that the, um, 20 years ago, it was all about getting your MBA and coming in and being a really slick marketeer or, or a very slick uh, um, operations person. Today, actually, it's really about being very process savvy, uh, good on systems, uh, but very, very good at working across organizations, across networks, across the matrix organization identifying issues, bringing those together, working in teams, uh, finding, finding the problems, what are the root causes, developing the countermeasures. That, that is the new kind of skill of the new guys coming in. And um, I think that's actually very exciting because it's actually, there's more to do, there's more to see, that more visibility. And somehow we have to get a blend between the wise heads who have got a lot of industry experience that aren't so savvy at the tools and applications needed to develop those solutions. And we've got a lot of really good, young, smart people coming into the workforce who are very good on, on, on problem solving and, and, and systems and process, but not very good at understanding what are the core issues that are actually causing the problems. And somehow we have to blend those up into, in, in a hybrid way. Um, so I, I'm actually really quite excited and optimistic about that. And I think our organization over the years, we will see some reduction in hit count but it'll be more in those sort of low value add admin intensive boring type jobs. And, and we can we can create and re unleash our middle management to be much more creative and more better at decision making. And if I can just just Jeremy before you because you you've gone through that, right? In the three in one and you know the last eight months. Can you tell us specifically about some of the issues and challenges that you faced in that process? Because definitely there were a lot of issues, right? You know, putting three companies in one. Three Japanese companies. Three Japanese companies in one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's not many MNAs where there's three parties coming together as one. That's, that's correct. Um, but uh, we, uh, we kind of did all the project work and, and, and engineering up front and, and defined as a management team that the new guys that are coming on board um, before we went live with the company, we decided we defined you know what core systems do we want, what core processes do we want, what organizational structure do we want, and we went for a very uniform approach. Um, and we're up and running with that now, at eight months in. Um, but but you know we're looking to refine and improve on that. So I think what you could say is that uh, it's about having a having a vision, having a plan, implementing the plan. 
but not getting stuck with the plan and being really ready to, to, to move on again with innovation and best practice and enhance and improve. So um, you can't change everything all at the same time, but very much when we started the company, we were very clear about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And so when people came on board, please guys, go with this, go with that, work to that plan, work to that, 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 that approach. But now we're starting to, to rethink that and, and, and encourage people to think about, well, how can we do better? How can we improve it? You know, in terms of the, you know, whether it's Six Sigma or it's Kaizen, um, process excellence, whatever you call it, this ability to continuously challenge what you're doing and how to improve, how to improve, how to improve, and making that a cultural mindset. And I think there's still many companies out there today where people don't know how to, to challenge or don't know what to challenge or how to go about doing it. I think, you know, all of us uh, in the industry, we have to uh, encourage our staff to challenge continuously what they're doing and how to improve and enhance. And uh, um, I think that, that that's something that's, that's very important uh, as part of that uh, change management improvement of our company's work. Sorry, Sorry. Okay. Okay. Okay, she's selling a book called Lean and Jump. This is, <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, uh, I think we have to move to another track now so that uh, Saku doesn't fall asleep. Huh? <laughs> no, that's always something for startup, right? So, um, you are a technical person, so I'm asking you technical questions from here, right? So, uh, somebody asked about your choice of cloud, right? So, there are so many clouds around, right? Not the dark clouds, but uh, Alibaba cloud, AWS, and tech cloud. So, this is a very problem for startups, right? Because, like you mentioned, uh, you have your top line, your bottom line, you're trying to tell people that you know, can save money. Um, maybe you can give some advice to the startups here because uh, the rest of the questions just now were very much for corporate. Right? Let's have our startup community with uh, how to make decisions uh, yeah. on uh, saving costs and offer more value. Okay, uh, let me share with you a secret. I'm not a technical guy. <laughs> My degree is in mechanical engineering, moving gears. <laughs> um, choice of cloud. Uh, very simple. Um, cost, right? Uh, obviously, but you don't go with the cheapest cost. Uh, you go with the cheapest cost that provides you the kind of assurance that you have in terms of cybersecurity, data confidentiality. Um, and unfortunately for us, or maybe fortunately, unfortunately for us is because we're starting to work with regulatory bodies, uh, some of them require on soil activities. Uh, so in those cases, um, we have to work with international cloud providers. So um, uh, we work with, you know, uh, open to, we work with AWS and AWS with data centers uh, in the countries that we operate. So we work with them uh, where we host certain data where we acquire on farm. That's it. Um, and, and we work for those that uh, provides us flexibility in costing but also willing to work with us in terms of our requirements, uh, in terms of how the data needs to be processed. Well, I, I think the other um, very important topic is about data privacy, right? How, how you protect, uh, how you choose uh, the data in the cloud so that um, that trust can always be there. So has this been a concern uh, by your customers, uh, clients, and you know, or you are proactive in it? No. <laughs> no, seriously. Nobody has actually asked us. At the most, they ask us about commercial confidentiality. Uh, I think it's a case of it's a given. You know, nobody asks about it anymore because it's a given. If you're providing a technical solution, you provide it at a level where uh, there's data security, data confidentiality, and privacy. And then you have your triple A, uh, your, your access authorization and uh, um, uh, authentication all sorted out. Uh, and I think it's, it's not that. It's not a concern, but I think it's a given. So uh, for, for any technical, technical company out there, um, I wouldn't put it as a selling point. Because it's like, you know, when, when, you, when you take a taxi, right, you expect that the taxi is able to take you from point A to point B. Nobody's gonna, uh, nobody's gonna ask, is the engine okay? Uh, has it been serviced recently? No, it's a given. Okay, Thomas, you wanna, oh, are you okay? We pass this question, how about Jeremy? I mean, you are running a big company, you handle data almost every day, right, not just, for a group, but also um, important data for your planning. And just now you talked about AI, uh, putting more IOTs in on board ships and uh, vessels. Uh, uh, what's your view? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's it's really challenging for for uh, international trading company, a shipping company, where 
you, 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 you're um, interfacing with so many different stakeholders and par parties in so many different countries, like the customs, like the freight forwarders, like the port authorities, the truckers, uh, you know, multiple parties. So you've got to be able to interchange data uh, and give people visibility to, to what's going on. But at the same time, you've got to, to avoid that, 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 that data, that data risk, that security cyber risk. And it's, it's a continuous challenge. Um, and we saw you know, one of our uh, competitors uh, go through a major cybersecurity problem uh, 18 months ago, uh, which, which must have been an absolute nightmare. I mean, that's all of our worst nightmares. That we, 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 we just go online and suddenly we can't get online and suddenly everything starts dropping. And uh, you know, we, we have 14,000 staff around the world, uh, 250 offices, 250 ships, um, 50,000 customers, and sudden, suddenly you can't communicate with them or connect with them. So it is a real living nightmare that we think about, plan about, and try as best we can to minimize the risk of that happening. But uh, it's getting more and more difficult, and, and um, some of the bad guys are always one step ahead. Um, and, and I don't think anybody's bulletproof. So we just have to work together to try to, I think, you know, if anybody's got an issue or problem, they've just got to stick their hand up, explain that they've got a problem or issue, and, and, and we, we try to fix it. Um, but it, it's a major concern. Right, okay. Um, is there anyone? Uh, okay, there's a gentleman here. Your question, please. And identify yourself, you can. Yeah, hello. Hello, Jenny here. Uh, I'm actually working on the refining energy sectors and to supply the fuel to the market. Actually, I have one question re um, for Jeremy actually regarding how the ship owners actually they can collaborate. I see your plan forward, which is two or three years later, you will see how to collaborate, etc. But how to make it faster and how to, for example, for a startup, so actually can can help. You know, as a startup, how actually can foster this kind of uh, you know, collaboration? Because, for example, first of, we're looking at something that first of all the ship owner has to collaborate, and then let's say fuel supplier like us or cargo, how they collaborate further. So I think that's something that we take to produce and want to see. Uh, what's up. Thank, thank you for the question, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you. Very good question. Um, in terms of sort of the IT systems uh, protocols, we talked about earlier on. Uh, we're trying to get our um, uh, shipping association with those those five six major carriers up and running as soon as possible. It's going through registry clearance at the moment. We're pushing, pushing, pushing to try and get that that going, so that in the next twelve months we can really start to to to, to, to get that, that going. I think specifically in, in the area of, of fuels and in the area of, of ships, um, you, you raise a very very good point, and uh, we do have to collaborate. We do have to work together. Um, the, uh, the, you know, we have 5,300 container ships in the world, roughly, today. Um, those are owned by, by the carriers, operators, but a lot of those are owned by third-party, non-operating owners as well. So they, they, they're part of that picture. Uh, we have the ship management companies. Um, and then we have the, uh, the, fun, the Funker uh, fuel management side, which is obviously a critical part of, the, of, of, of our business. Um, but we're calling at four or five hundred ports around the world, and we're probably bunkering in 60, 70 ports in the world. Um, and, and we need that collaboration also with the, with the, with the bunkering companies and the port authorities uh, in, in all those locations. And you know, the critical one is really the standardization around that the fuel quality, and particularly uh, January 2020, when we all have to go to the new IMO regulation to ensure that we have, have that standardized quality. But I think there's a lot of work going on. But is it is it perfect? No, it's not. Um, but there's a lot of effort going in to try to improve the situation. Okay. Thomas, you want to say something about collaboration that uh, you know, MPA is driving to get uh, you know, at least the, the ones that uh, pass through Singapore's port to collaborate using technologies? Yeah, some views are mentioned about leading lab and uh, uh, that sort of uh, yeah, Maybe just a big one, because uh, one of the challenges is always about the data, right? And then some Data, how to get those data to, to validate your, your business and uh, try, try our algorithms and all that. So a starting point for us is uh, we uh, create MPA, uh, started a maritime data hub where uh, we build APIs and some of the data that we have in terms of vessel data, crew data. Uh, of course, subject to the some of the data governance issues, uh, we have to discuss with data owner as well. 
uh, as well as those vessels that's coming in and going out of the port of Singapore. It generates a lot of very rich data for companies to actually do modern assimilations, data analytics in terms of uh, trying to come up with algorithms to predict vessel arrival, departure, uh, optimization of their uh, algorithms, um, and all that. So um, that data hub would be made available uh, sometime this year. So any startups that need this data, uh, maritime data, can actually contact us, um, and we will be happy to open up uh, access for you to connect to the API to, um, to assess these sets of data uh, for your project uh, validation. Uh, of course, uh, in the longer run, we want to also encourage companies uh, to come forward to contribute to this um, data hub uh, for more richer sets of data. Um, so that is uh, one uh, initiative uh, that we're doing. Um, on the other, maybe on you yeah. can yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, on the SMI front, uh, what we are trying to do is uh, we are also in discussion with SMI and trying to cross pollinate some of the past R and D projects uh, into the uh, for applications by the startup because a lot of startups that we see in the past competitions about using existing um, technology sometimes not very big tech um, and trying to solve a problem which is fine, but in the longer run when you try to scale the solution for global applications, you are competing against a lot of uh, international and global players. That's when you need a very um, differentiated uh, capabilities and the deep tech. Uh, hopefully, some of these R&D outcomes can help you to uh, enhance upon the algorithms by working uh, with the research institutions in Singapore. Uh, so that is uh, one part. Okay, can I can I have last two questions from the floor before I uh, ask our you know panelists to sum up? Right. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just um, one more for Jeremy and Thomas. Um, so, I think with regards to decarbonization, um, there's a lot of pressures in the industry. But I think you can also see that maybe longer term, from outside the industry, the greatest pressure might come. I, I think we'll see a day when Apple will have a carbon neutral product. Um, so, I'm just curious to, to hear uh, from you, Jeremy, and you, Thomas, do you see a carbon neutral future for? The shipping line and, and the ports, especially. Jeremy, start this. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I do very much. Um, the the IMO 2020 is is, is just a small uh, speed bump in the road uh, on a long journey to improve technology and, and decarbonize shipping. Um, and uh, what we've really now got to focus on is 2030, 2035. The IMO now starting to come out with some very clear guidelines about how many, how much we have to reduce our carbon footprint by and what average we have to bring it down by. So um, uh, the, personally, I'm I, I, I not so happy with the uh, let out clause by the IMO to allow scrubbers to exist in, in, in January 2020. I think that just causes further difficulties for, 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 the, for the refining industry in terms of clarity of, of what type of fuel supply to shipping companies. Um, and actually we should be spending that time and influence much more on finding carbon neutral or car zero carbon emissions for the ships. The LNG uh, is, is the kind of next one that's being progressed, but uh, I think as you, know, as you know, LNG is not really, it's good for the NOx, good for the SOx, but it only reduces the carbon footprint by about 20%. It's not really a long-term winner. So we need to find, uh, whether it's methanol, it's, it's hydrogen, it's hydrogen, uh, it's fuel cells, uh, we, we need to get to that uh, that next technology to start bringing that technology on board in 2030, 2035, 2040, so that we can genuinely aim by 240, 245 for, 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 for carbon neutrality. And, and, and something, frankly, I feel very passionate about, and I, we need to do it. And one of the things we've been talking at uh, on a collaborative basis amongst the shipping companies um, is that uh, we do not have that technological skill today to be able to do that. Um, and we need to encourage um, the, uh, the, the, the chemical engineers, the researchers, uh, the, the, the brilliant technicians, uh, the academics that are working in other industries to help decarbonize those industries. We need to encourage them to come across into the shipping industry and help us find a solution or a way forward so that we can really genuinely have uh, ships that are not using any type of fossil fuel from new ships maybe from 230 and, and certainly all phased out by 2040 something like that so we, we do need to do it. it it is important we do it I think the wills there it's the how at the moment that's the imperative we need to find a way forward
Okay. And uh, Tom, what's your view of uh, zero carbon? Um, so uh, right now, a lot of focus is also about the, the local pollutions, uh, which are more uh, socks and knots, uh, which will affect the immediate uh, population here. In terms of uh, regulations, um, trying to do faster than the international community, um, I'm not so sure whether that will happen in Singapore, as will happen in Europe and US, where the citizens there are much more conscious and very um, active in pushing for carbon, the zero carbon emission count. But of course, they also have the, the natural advantage, economic uh, friends that they have hydrocarbon, uh, not, uh, dams, hydropower, thermal power, wind power, and they are able to achieve a lot of these ambitions through natural power. So, um, which is great for them. But Singapore, um, at least for maritime, we look at it, actually we, we don't have a lot of wind and uh, hydro and thermal to, to harvest. Uh, so that is already one uh, area that's uh, imposing some um, sort of disadvantage. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about co-ironing, providing co-ironing options, which is the uh, electrical power systems to ships calling the power of Singapore and all that. So we talked to terminal operators, various players, and it has to be industry driven because um, if the, the cost advantage is not there, and assuming Singapore imposes the regulations and trying to push and say, hey, you come in, uh, you, you better be on electric power charged through, cost is high, and um, and uh, the, the shipping lines or whoever is going to bear the cost and say, hey, Singapore hot, hot, not so attractive, you know. So it has to be a regional, I, I think if you import anything, it has to be regional. Uh, agreement that in, in this region we wanted, you know, um, this kind of uh, ICA or SICA equivalent so that we don't put Singapore at this level. But having said that, uh, we are also trying to uh, as forecast future industry demands in terms of um, cleaner energy. So LNG is already in a big way. Um, we are collaborating with about 10 ports around the world trying to come LNG bunkering standards. So um, ships calling different ports can take LNG safely and uh, the right quality. Um, so that's important, but LNG is not the only solution because um, I think it's only about 20% uh, less carbon than in the normal fuel. Uh, but it does have a much lower, uh, even near zero, socks and knots uh, equivalent. So that helps local pollution. Uh, other alternative energy electrifications, um, fuel cells, even methanol, uh, we also supported some of the R&D projects to push on the So whatever the, uh, the industries is expected um, to be moving, uh, we are actually uh, trying to allow different energy mix for the needs of the industries to, um, to for ships visiting port Singapore to be able to take those uh, energy mix. Yeah, so that is the current development that is ongoing. Okay, uh, one last question. I would uh, give the chance to the uh, audience on this side because it seems to be quiet. Anybody here who would like to ask a question? Any startups? I think uh, so far we... Uh, uh, any. No one? Okay, no problem. Uh, this is uh, the start of the Chinese New Year's uh, <laughs> year of the ball, so the, the pig is a bit quiet, <laughs> all of us. <laughs> um, okay, the pig in us are not here. Yeah? Um, so maybe I can request uh, all our panelists uh, uh, not to uh, give a fortune telling uh, of what this year, but how do you read the tea leaves uh, uh, for you know, shipping? Uh, industry or maritime, you know, uh, are you optimistic? Are you neutral? Are you pessimistic? Uh, you know, they are not going to bet on it, but I think uh, it might be uh, good to hear from you, you know, uh, what our views are, and then next year when you have a chance to, you know, come back again, we can uh, <laughs> check who is correct. <laughs> no, just kidding. So, Jeremy, uh, are you, uh, what, what are your views are, you know, about the, not just your company, but the industry? Uh, you know? yeah, I think, I think everyone generally optimistic. Um, uh, I think if the, uh, if the real interesting one is, is back to the innovation and technology and how we can uh, really leverage and develop further solutions and ideas uh, to digitalize the whole uh, shipping, liner shipping, uh, wider logistics market much more intensively going forward. So very, very optimistic. But we need to work in a collaborative way to achieve that and uh, try and help each other to make some, some betterment and improvement. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Shaku, what do you think? Uh, um, I, I think the, the evergreen stuff of 
wanting to uh, do things uh, faster, uh, more efficiently, uh, and more compliant has always been there. Uh, but two changes that, uh, that uh, we personally see in our cohort is that, uh, number one, uh, there is a greater desire uh, of our partners and even the, uh, the shippers to better collaborate across the supply chain. I think, I think this realisation that uh, you have to work with multiple parties and wanting to be able to actually get uh, visibility and control of the supplier, your supplier, is, is coming up. Uh, and the second thing is uh, what we tend to see is uh, there's a new realignment of trading. You know, containers that used to go this way are now going this way. And uh, what the, what's good for us is that when when you're a platform or, or you are a solution that allows people to to change, to interoperate, to be agile, then there's a space for them. So, so those are the, the, the two things that we're saying and uh, we think will continue. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas? <coughs> I think this is a, quite an exciting and good time for tech companies and startups to come into the maritime space because uh, as all of you are aware, the other sectors, uh, there are a lot of uh, already been uh, solutions developed, uh, heavy competitions out there, but maritime is starting to open up in the last few years. And Singapore being the hub for a lot of maritime companies, um, this is really the place uh, to be for entrepreneurs, uh, tech startups, and trying to um, look out new solutions for the maritime industry, both uh, problem solving, but also looking at the future casting, uh, thinking of new new concept of operations that, uh, that the, the current companies may not uh, look at, because uh, these are the technologies uh, enabled new business models that are made possible, and, and this is probably uh, over and above what the assets uh, managing companies are looking at. These are all uh, data-driven uh, kind of uh, opportunities and new business model. And uh, our observations in the last few years because of the, the joint efforts of the industries, a lot of companies are already setting up their own incubator arm, VCs arm, and working with, uh, with external parties. So this is really a good time to come in because the big tech are not into this, not yet into this space yet. Uh, and the incumbent shipping companies are also wary of the big tech, which is other Amazon and all those things. Uh, eventually, they may come into this space uh, at some point in time. Um, but uh, it's, it's really, they have not uh, really penetrated in because incumbents are also quite wary. But the incumbents, which are the shipping companies and the market, are also uh, quite receptive of working in startups because working startups threat is uh, it's not really there. And they can innovate their processes. They can even be part of their new business able to grow a new business horizon. So I will see um, this is the best place to be. Opportunity is there uh, and um, it's really a good time to come in yeah, before the window opportunities start to uh, narrow down, you know, when the competition starts to, um, you know, companies start to scale up and uh, then yeah, the, uh, the winners will take a uh, large part of them. Okay, I think uh, we have a very, very balanced view today. Uh, thank you very much to the gentlemen. You know, we have uh, Jeremy who uh, um, got us his time uh, to be here and uh, there's still opportunity to talk to him after this and uh, also Safir. You know, wish you all the best uh, this year, you know, grow more um, into ASEAN first, you're saying, yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, one of your uh, key goals. And of course, uh, through the support of MPA and US Enterprise, it's privileged that uh, we have a couple of different programs like Pier 71. Uh, which is also uh, well supported by MPA. I hope more collaboration can happen. And uh, with that note, I would like to then um, have the opportunity uh, to present you the mascot from NUS. Right, this is uh, his name is called Linus. It's, it's not other, any other names, uh, not Lioness. Uh. Linus, uh, so it's a male. So I will give to uh, Yari first. Last year we give you an apron, so I don't know what you did with the apron. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's up to, thank you very much for coming. Um, and also, Thomas, I don't know where you have won already, but <laughs> we can have twins. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, Haruko san, right, you are our co organizer for today. Please come forward uh, and receive your li lioness, not lioness. Oh, Dr. Sanjay. Oh, okay. You are nominated by. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll give another one to, uh, to uh, Haruko. Yeah, please, yeah, thank you very much for coming. Also, um, uh, Dr. Sanjay from uh, SMI. Um, and uh, we'll please hold on for us to take a good photo and then uh, dinner and some light dinner will be up.
Oke. Itu ada one, two, three. One more, one, two, three. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, uh, okay. You have something to say. <laughs> so. Uh, everyone uh, uh, interested in Ocean of Opportunity 2019, please find the uh, uh, contact, SCS contact on the wall, and please register. Or uh, please uh, find my colleague, 1K. 1K? Hi. So, uh, so please find and um, chase her uh, for further uh, uh, information. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, okay there's some logistics. Uh, Felicia will uh, have something to say. Not much logistics, but thank you everyone once again for coming. Can we give a round of applause for everybody, including the panelists and our moderator? Yes. Please sit outside uh, for some refreshments, and uh, Hakobo also has a booth and.